But you ever been out on the beach? And you land out on the beach and the sun is out there and the waves are blowing. And you're out there for a while. And you come back in the hotel or the motel, the resort, whatever it is, your camper, I don't know, your tent. And you, you just got salt all over you. Have you ever been out working in the yard, sweating? You know, that's an Adam problem right there. Earn your living by the sweat of your brow. Thank you, Adam. And, and, and you, you're sweating. You wash your face and you salty. How many of you, how many of you ever taste that salt? You know, when you sweat, that's of the devil. You know, when you sweat, you, 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 salt comes to the surface. Did you know that? Did you, do y'all have any idea what I'm talking about? Well, thank God somebody does. I, sure know what I'm doing. I know some of you are wondering. The salt life. Now, in, in centuries past, in about 2700 B.C., that's, that's not before a headache, that's before Christ. 2700, Hippocrates believed that salt had healing medicinal value. You know, well over two-thirds of the world is covered with water. And what's in most of that water? Most of the water is salt water. And in Roman times, back in the times of Jesus... Salt was actually used at one point by the Roman authorities because currency was, I don't know what was going on in their economy, but currency was, a, there was a shortage of it, and they actually paid their soldiers in salt. Did y'all know that? And in the Bible, there's at least three occasions where you offer some sort of a sacrifice which is sanctified by salt. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> no? It, it, any of you find any of that interesting? <clears throat> I know some of you think, well, I can't study the Bible. I don't care anything about no salt. I'm married. I love salt. How many of y'all love salt? Country folk up in here, y'all like fried green tomatoes? You got to have some salt. How many of you salt your food before you even taste your food? You know, I wake up in the middle of the night doing this right here. You say, what's that? That's Janet slapping me for doing this right here. Y'all, how many of you salt your food? You just salt your tomato. How many of you like a plate of tomatoes? You like to salt the tomatoes. You eat the tomatoes, or if you're really from the country, maters. And then when you're done, what y'all do? Anybody? Y'all know what I'm talking about? I feel an anointing in here today. I know some of you are like, what are you talking about? Well, you know what? Isn't it interesting that in, Ma uh, excuse me, in John chapter 5, verse 13, they'll show it to you on the screen here. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. In Roman times, they coined a phrase that maybe you're familiar with. Man, I really like him. He's really a man of his salt. In the Hebrew uh, culture, they actually had a salt covenant with God. If you ever look at the original painting of Michelangelo of the what we call the Last Supper, which it wasn't the last, it was the Lord's Supper with his disciples, there in front of Jesus, uh, Janet was going to see if they could pull that up. I don't know if they made it or not. They were going to show a picture of the Last Supper, and in the front of Jesus, the one painted by Michelangelo, there was a salt shaker, and the salt shaker, I don't know if this is it, this is probably one of those replica pictures, huh, over here. Where is it? Oh, right here. You see, the, you see the guy right in front of the spilled salt? You know who that is? That's Judas. You see the, you see the salt shaker spilt? You know why? Because Judas is about to get up and go betray Jesus. He broke the salt covenant. Now, when you start thinking about that, that salt is very valuable. Matter of fact, how much of your body has the mineral salt in it? Sodium. Some sort of a sodium. You can have too much salt and have a stroke or a heart attack. You can have too little salt through perspiration or whatever, and you become dehydrated. Leg cramps, what they call uh, restless legs. A lot of things in our body are minerals. And in, in medicine or medicinal areas, see, I was in Bad Kreuznach. That's not the best way to say it in German. That's the best Arkansas can get it. The word B-A-D meant bath. And throughout Bad Kreuznach, where I was stationed in the military, they had bathhouses. 
Matter of fact, there was one particular place where everybody went swimming, and they were all playing, kicking the soccer ball, you know, what they call football. And uh, they had big evergreen trees, and they had mist with minerals, sodium and other minerals, flowing through that, misting. And you could walk through these rows of trees, and it was supposed to have medicinal value. value. You know, like hot springs, the bathhouses that the park and recreation uh, operate there. What's in that water? Minerals. And one of those primary minerals is salt. Every living organism needs salt. Entire cultures were developed around where salt is. Why? Because you cannot exist without salt. Everybody, come on. Got to have me some salt. J.C. Penney, they say, would interview a potential employee. And if the employee sat down at dinner and they served the meal, picked up the salt shaker and, and began to salt before he or she tasted, he wouldn't hire them. I never worked for J.C. Penney. <laughs> no chance. Now, salt is a valuable mineral. It's a necessary mineral. Plants are water. Salt. So I want us to think about what, what did Jesus say when he was speaking, one who came to fulfill the law and the prophets, when he said to his followers, you are the salt of the earth, salt of the world, he was declaring something to them that they understood. See, a lot of times we read stories of we're salt. Okay. Jesus said we're salt. What does that mean? So let's look at what salt means. What are some of the properties of salt? Now, in, in years past, I've heard messages that part of the principles of Jesus saying you're salt, salt is white, that represents purity, and so forth and so on. Now, I'm really not going to go that direction today. So let's just look at the words of Jesus. You are the salt of the earth. Are you salty? Are you salty? But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Now let's stop for just a moment and think about this. You're the salt of the earth. One thing salt does, it makes you thirsty. One thing I think Jesus is saying to his disciples is, I, you are the salt of the earth, and I want you to live your life in a way that causes others to be thirsty for the living water. That there's something about you that people need, that people can't survive without, and I want you to live your life in a way where they come to you because there's something you have that they desperately need. Do you get that? You're the salt of the earth. And that's why he goes on and says, but if salt loses its saltiness, it, how can it be made salty again? See, because in Revelations, Jesus, in an open vision revelation to John the, Bab, uh, John the Apostle on the Isle of Patmos, said this. He said, because you are neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm. I will spew you out of my mouth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? You know one of the greatest problems in the world? It's not really, now listen to me, I know this is going to mess you up, but one of the great problems in the world is not sin. Sin's been dealt with. Everybody hadn't appropriated their forgiveness, but one of the great problems in the world is not sin. That just comes natural. One of the great problems in the world is the church has lost its saltiness. One of the great problems in the world is we think church ought to be a giant salt lick. That the world should have to come to us to get some salt. And that's not what Jesus said. You're the salt of the world. You're the salt of the earth. You go to the world. You sprinkle. I'm going to sprinkle you. Well, I just wish we could just all live peacefully together. You're salt. Even as much as I love salt, I don't take my big blue salt. I got no little baby salt thing. I got a big blue one, a girl with an umbrella, and, and, a, and she walking like that in the rain, and salt still salting. You know what I'm talking about? We go on Facebook, and I ought to be able to get me some free advertisement now, that deal right there. Get me five million hits, sell advertisement. Get me that big old salt thing. You open it up. You know, what I, you know, that's all what it says when you do it. Y'all ever hear it do that? I, even as much as I like salt, I don't take that big blue mamma jamma and just go. You know what I do? 
And if you get too much on a tomato, what do you do? Lick the tomato. <laughs> Try it again. Too little salt, you can become dehydrated and affects you physically. Too much salt, they say. You know who they are. There's people you quote when you don't know who they are. It can kill you, give you a heart attack or a stroke, high blood pressure. It can. If salt loses its saltiness, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. That kind of reminds me of this vine story that Jesus gave in John 15. What did he say about branches that do not bear fruit? You gather them up, throw them out. Explain to me how our world can be in the conditions then when we're the salt. So let's look at some of the actual principles and applications of salt and when Jesus said you're salt they went oh I get it not oh what's he mean by that so let's think about it some of the values of salt it's precious salt was actually used by Rome to pay their soldiers it was a currency Sometimes they traded salt. Entire communities were built around salt. Why? Because it's essential. It's not optional. It's essential. Everybody, come on, it's essential. Got to have some salt. This world needs salt. I mean, it would be nice if, if we just tell you, what, here's what we do. We all go to the same church. We all live in the same neighborhood. And we put a big barricade around it. And we just all love each other. We don't even love each other at church. How are we going to love each other in the neighborhood? That's the truth. But, you know, that's kind of this fantasy thinking that we have that, you know, wouldn't it be great? But that's not what you do with salt. You don't put salt in a big pile in the middle of your plate. You sprinkle it. And that's what God has done with us as his children is he's sprinkling us at your workplace. If you're a school teacher, he sprinkled you there. Be salty. If he's put you in, in some profession in the medical field, be salty. When you go into the patient's room, be salty. Now, this is going to make a little bit more sense as we go. I hope. But one thing I want you to grasp, since salt was a form of currency, it's also a form of a covenant. That salt, in, when Jesus said you're salt, he's explaining that you are valuable. You're valuable. You're precious in the eyes of God. Now, many of us grow up in a dysfunctional home. I say it like this. I was dysfunctional before dysfunctional was cool. How many of you grew up in a dysfunctional home? You've come through a broken family, and you're believing God for a complete healing and restoration. But when you stop and think, I'm valuable. Well, let's stop and we just celebrated resurrection. We just talking about the cross weeks before. How valuable are you? Well, Jesus died for you. Why? So you could be a part of the family of God. God wants relationship with you. God reconciled the world. He reconciled the world to himself. God did what's necessary for you and I to have relationship with him. That's because God thinks you're valuable. How many of you have ever said this to kids? How many of you have ever said this to your kids? Because I said so. You know why you're valuable? Because God said so. Now, let me tell you how much God values you. Let's just look at some ways of where we could personally relate to this value of God saying, you are salt. You're valuable to me. You're precious to God. How many of you love your dog? I mean, we spend billions of dollars in America on our pets. We love our dog. God loves you more than you love your dog. How many of you love your cat? And you know you love cats because ain't nobody got one cat. You got one cat, you got two, three. I had a lady used to shop where I worked. She had 32 cats. God loves you more than she loved her 32 cats. Now, you can love your cat, but you don't ever know if they love you. We had a cat straight from Hades, man. We prayed and fasted that somebody merciful would take that cat. 
I was sitting in Natchitoches, Louisiana with my good friend Roger and Charlotte Mersbrock in their house sitting in Roger's, uh, in, the, uh, in one of them Queen Anne chairs. And I'm talking to them. And the cat, I find out after the fact, that was the cat's chair. <laughs> well, there's Roger and there's Charlotte. And, and, and he's pastor down there. They are. And, and they're talking. Well, the cat doesn't realize there's a guest in the house. The cat jumps up on the chair to land in all fours. Midair, that cat says, Rawr! and realizes I'm in the chair. When that cat hit me, that cat peeled out all fours like this. Woo! And shot down the hallway and went in a bedroom and I guess under a bed. I'm bleeding. <laughs> a cat from there. Cats just look at you. They lay around all day. Sleep 23 hours a day. Get up. You done open the can, put it in the little can pot, and they come over and... <laughs> no, I ain't eat no friskies. <laughs> Cats, no thank you. You know how much God loves you, how precious you are? You are salt. You are more valuable. You, God loves you more than you love your cat. You love your kids? The only reason I work is because i got seven grandkids. I can't afford to retire. Y'all know what I'm saying? How many of you love your children? Wouldn't it be good if they love you back? God loves you more than you love your children. Grandparents, you love your grandchildren? God loves you more than you love your grandchildren. That's how precious you are. That's how valuable you are. They use salt as currency as a form of exchange. God loves you so much that he exchanged, Jesus exchanged his life, took your death upon him that you could have your life upon you. Come on. That's how valuable you are. You are precious in the eyes of God. So I just wrote here, you are a highly valued carrier of the Holy Spirit of God. Isn't that awesome? You understand that God loves you. He, that's what it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? Say, I'm no shack. Can you say I'm no shack? Now, duck commander, I ain't no shack, Jack. Well, you know, I just want, if I could just go to heaven and have me a small cabin on the outskirts of heaven. There ain't no outskirts of heaven, and Jesus didn't go there to build you a log cabin. I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions, and He has made you a temple, and He don't live in no shack. I could say a little bit more about that shack thing, but I've run too many people off already. Do you not know your bodies are temples? What kind of temple would God have? Well, look in the Bible. What, did he, what kind of temple did He have? Did He use junk in there? You are the temple of God. You are valuable. You're highly prized in the eyes of God. So do not demean what God calls holy. Do not belittle what God said is awesome. Greater is he that's in you. You are the temple of God than he that's in the world. Look at the person beside you and say, you're looking better already. I'd like to say more about that, but I've got three points. Point number two. As a disciple, we're like salt because we have a preserving influence. The bathhouses have medicinal value. I want you to think about that. I came home from Bible school. I think it was the, I think it was the winter of 1973 or January, February of 1974. My dad, who was a cook in the Army for almost 11 years, grew up as a country guy. and We grew up on a farm. And I came home from Bible school, and my daddy has two hogs that we're going to butcher. I know that troubles some of you. I know some of you shouldn't be killing pigs. You ought to get your meat at the grocery store like everybody else. <laughs> and my daddy killed those two pigs along with another gentleman. And they cut those pigs up into pieces. And then dad took the ham. Oh, I felt some anointing on that right there. He took the ham. And he 
cut between the skin of that pig and the fat of that pig and the meat of that ham, and he cut around it like that. And then he took a whole bunch of salt, and he packed it down in there. How many of you ever gone to the store and you bought you some salt pork? Anybody ever? No, y'all even know what salt pork is? Whew, collard greens. Collard greens. Got to have some salt pork. Turnip greens. Mustard. Got to have some salt pork. Yeah, a little piece of salt pork. Ain't. How many of you ever, ever opened up a can of pork and beans? That's pork, singular. Beans, plural. At my house, Mama, can I have the pork? No, sissy gets it. She got it last time. How many of you ever had those arguments over pork and beans? That's a little piece of salt pork. That's all that is. Salt has a preserving value. You know all the world's getting corrupt and decaying? Because the church is so busy having church, we're not being salty. And too many of us in churches are giving people salt substitutes. i let that settle. Salt substitute. It's not the real thing. We, matter of fact, here at this church, we got, we got imitation Shekinah glory. We turn on that fog machine, this whole thing will fill up. In the Bible, it says the glory of God filled the temple and the ministers couldn't even preach. Wouldn't that be a Sunday failure right there? So what happened at church? Preacher didn't preach. Oh, must have been God. It'd been a miracle, wouldn't it? I can tell you back before TNT burned many, many years ago, the power of God filled that, that little old white vinyl building so strong, I could not preach that Sunday. Now, the next week I preached for three hours, but, you know, I had to make up. I couldn't preach. The Bible says the Shekinah glory of God filled the temple as they worshipped him. That the glory of God, we didn't have to use glory substitute. We used that to create prisms what I call eye candy. But see, we got a whole generation that's been given salt substitute. Rarely do you even see a Bible or a verse. We're told what we need to do, but we, we don't ever receive salt. His Word is what feeds us and sustains us. If we are salt, what is Jesus? He's the head of the church. How many of you ever said to your kids, well, because I said so? What makes us valuable? Well, because God said we're valuable. You are salt. What's one of the qualities of salt? It preserves. It prevents decay and corruption. Well, think about it. If you're salt, you're the preserving, you're the preserving quality in the earth. Now, I want you to think about that. As you think about being salt and having a preserving quality, why is the world in the condition it's in? If we're to be sprinkled all through the community, all through the world, so that people don't have to come to the salt lick, we take the salt to them. Salt adds flavor. I mean, I love me some greens. Even with salt pork, I still got to have my own special. It preserves. It has a healing, according to hypocrisies. And some medical professionals, they'll say the body must have salt to be healthy. The world, in order for it to be healthy, needs salt. And you know what we use to try to win the world? Sugar. I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm a little off base here, but I've heard a rumor that cancer cells feed off of sugar. And here's what we try to do to the world. Well, we just want to be sweet. Y'all come to church, we won't mention sin. We'll call it a mistake. Matter of fact, the song we sang today, He forgives us our wrongs. Because that sounds better because who wants to talk about sin? I don't want to talk about sin at church. Let's talk about wrongs. I'm sorry I did wrong. Jesus didn't die for your wrongs. Or your shrongs. That's just so strong. He died for your sins. 
and died for your sin. Not just so you can be sprinkled, but so you can be changed forever. So let's think about that. It has a healing, not just a preserving and something that prevents decay. It also has a, a healing, medicinal value. Isn't it fascinating that when Moses led the children of Israel out of 400 years of bondage, this was generation after generation of generation of slavery, when he led them out of Egypt, there was not one sick person among them. Interesting. But see, we live in a generation that if we have a symptom, the first thing we do is run to the medicine chest rather than the great physician. The one thing that we ought to be to the world is medicinal. There should be a healing. Our word should be seasoned with salt. We should be gracious. But see, we don't have to, we don't have to dilute. Matter of fact, when it talks about salt, when they created that brine, they would take the remains, what was left that wasn't the crystal, and they threw it away. We don't have to dilute the message to make the messenger palatable to the world. We need to be salt and not give them a salt substitute or sugarcoat the message. See, the reality is if you sugarcoat the message, more people find it palatable, but they don't find it transformational. I challenge you to let God open your eyes of what it means to be salt. Point number three. If, let's, let's go back. Say this with me. I am a salty Christian. Let God sprinkle you. Let him use you to bring flavor, healing, and preservation to a dying world. Can you put a couple of those scriptures up there uh, from Timothy maybe? Why is it important? Look at this. Because in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. Anybody, anybody relate to that? Does that sound like something they wrote 2,000 years ago is applied today? How many of you have told the sad stories about how, uh, how poor you were? Anybody here? You were raised poor? You know, the older, older adults get, the poorer they were. You know the stories, right? When I, I tell you, I was so poor when I grew up. I walked, I walked, uh, I walked to school, uphill both ways, barefooted, in the. You've heard the stories. Now we got a whole generation called young millennials. What are they going to tell their kids? I was so poor when I grew up. I didn't get an iPad till I was ten. I was so poor when I grew up, my blue jeans didn't even have holes in them. <laughs> what kind of world we living in? Hi, this is Perry Black, and I want to let all of our viewers know that all of my messages are free, and you can download those at FamilyChurchBryant.org, and I'll see you next week right here on BTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection.